use development where you can walk and 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 uh, do most things without driving a car that's beyond just having a walkable environment Thank you. I would also suggest adding a uh, bikeable next to walkable. I, I know, I mean, walkable wasn't a word a while ago and bikeable is becoming so. And, and besides biking being a major thing and, and, and becoming used more often, especially with electric bikes, but we're also seeing, of course, electrification of other, you know, like scooters and all that. And so if we have bike lanes and shared pathways, be from bike, from biking, it will also transfer into all that electric scooters and skateboards and all that stuff coming. A uh, couple of couple of things on the um, the idea of uh, having intersection density be a metric that we try to optimize. That that really responds to Ted's point. Um, the um, a, a well-connected street network, uh, whether it's grid-like or or has a hybrid design like Daybreak, Daybreak's network isn't. You wouldn't call it a grid, but it's certainly well-connected. Um, the um, the idea of having uh, few cultists. I, I'm not saying that there shouldn't be any cul-de-sacs um, because there are certain sites that lend themselves to cul-de-sacs. But, but um, the other metric that is commonly used in urban planning is the percentage of four-way uh, intersections uh, versus three-way. Uh, you think of a three-way intersection as ultimately having uh, less connectivity than four-way, and th there, there's a downside to that um, in in terms of um, uh, traffic safety. Uh, four-way intersections have higher, uh, like I live in the avenues, have higher uh, crash rates typically than three-way intersections, but uh, living in the avenues, uh, which is a grid, uh, didn't, you know, as, 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 as Ted pointed out, you don't have to have a perfect grid to have good connectivity. Um, I, I would like to see, if we're, if we're going to start introducing metrics, I'd like to see um, the uh, connectivity measured, not only in terms of intersection density, which tends to be very short, short blocks, but in terms of, of four-way intersections rather than three-way and cul-de-sacs. Thank you. Another thing you say, streets and buildings should be oriented to protect view corridors. What, what I, I, I thought of when I started reading that sentence, I thought it would read streets and buildings, the building should be oriented towards streets as opposed to toward parking. The, the thing that makes the uh, suburban, typical suburban strip development so uh, unwalkable is the fact that uh, the buildings are typically oriented toward parking lots as opposed to streets. So, you know, the whole idea of a form-based code is to kind of move, move the, the buildings up to the street rather than uh, having them hidden behind large parking lots. So that sentence, streets and buildings should be oriented to protect view corridors. You might have another sentence, buildings should be oriented towards streets rather than parking lots. Great. Yeah. Or, or just prohibit parking lots between buildings and streets. Yeah, that would, that, that would, would be fine. I, I like Reed's language a little bit better because there are lots of examples. You can go down to University Parkway in, in Orem where the new um, BRT line is and you have lots of buildings that are placed towards the street, but they're still oriented towards the parking lot, which really discourages pedestrian activity. 
that's maybe not an ideal example because it's such a huge thoroughfare, but I see that all the time in some recent developments where the placement of the building is between the parking and the street, but the orientation is still very much towards the parking lot. We're having that struggle in Sugar House with some of the developments from 10 or 20 years ago that are not contributing to a vibrant pedestrian experience as some of the more recent ones, but transitioning them is difficult because they're still oriented toward, predominantly towards parking lots. Good, that's great input. Anything else on that one? Okay, uh, we'll move to the uh, paragraph on regional coordination. What did you see there, or thoughts you might have? Alan, maybe there is a sentence that, that talks about, and you can help me out if this is actually present somewhere else, that talks about the community fabric around the site. So in other words, there's, there's the region and then there is the, the community. Um, certainly that's present in language about connectivity. Um, you know, and I, this one, I know this, this one is more of a process point, isn't it? So maybe this is not the right spot for that kind of language. Well, it's, it's a good point, and you know, I, I tried to capture that in that, what is it, the penultimate sentence, providing connectivity to surrounding communities and regional infrastructure, but uh, we, can, we can call that out more. I don't know if this belongs under bold ideas or regional coordination, but the whole idea of Wasatch Choice for 2050, which I probably talk too much about, but I'm, I'm so impressed with our vision, um, is to have um, centers um, well connected by transit. Uh, and the centers uh, tend to be uh, densest and have the highest floor area ratios um, uh, closer to downtown. And then as you move away from downtown, uh, you get um, pr probably a little uh, lower intensity of land use. And I, again, I don't know whether that's picked up by this, the idea of a authentic walkable Main Street, but uh, I, I would wants this to be one of the centers on the uh, 2050 map. Um, and um, you, you, if, you, if you have it as a center uh, even, uh, or, or a portion or maybe more than one center, you, you might have more than one center, um, it will uh, be totally coincident with the with the idea of uh, Wasatch Choice for 2050. Yeah, I think that's very much the idea that uh, you know, we'll have a transit line through here and this will be a new center in the region. So thanks. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. <laughs> and Alan and Reed, uh, on the existing Wasatch Choice vision, it, uh, this, this site is identified as an urban center. So that can certainly be refined as things move forward, but we, we currently have at WFRC and everybody else, um, but partners have that as a as an urban center currently. Good. Thanks. Alan, uh, Sean Seeger here. I'm just reading the underneath transportation, uh, preferably using autonomous electric vehicles using inductive charging. I wonder if that's maybe too prescriptive in terms of Kind of designing or telling them what we want to see rather than them being creative but uh i, I think you're asking for a critique of it so there's a a critique yeah yeah thank you uh, before we jump to transportation anything more on the regional coordination piece all right yeah let's let's um, jump into that alan, transportation and that's uh, alan, that alan 
Sorry, I wanted to add one other thing. You know, th this may be addressed in a couple of other sections, but it may be worth just referencing in the regional coordination. There's a lot of regional coordination going on right now around the Jordan River. And I know the river f has been very central to the vision for the point of the mountain area. One of the real challenges that we have right now is that we don't really have a river in Bluffdale and Draper. It, uh, at least through this stretch of it, it is, it is really a creek and improving water flow in the river to be able to develop something like a kayak park or a real water river oriented recreation amenity. Uh, I'm heading into a meeting just after this one where we're going to be talking about this very thing. Um, and so um, getting, getting water flow back into the Jordan River to create a river that can be an amenity, I think is a regional coordination issue that maybe can be addressed somehow in this because it will take a regional effort to, to return the Jordan River to a river um, at some point in the future. And so I just make reference here because that may fit under regional coordination to some degree. Thank you, Soren. And, and that is a big deal and one that I've supported over the years. I, I might suggest that, you know, the point that 700 acres is not going to be able to take on getting water into the, the Jordan River. And when I'm talking about regional coordination, I think I'm not talking about general regional coordination, but more about how this site fits in with uh, the broader region. So th that may be a, a bigger idea than what we can take on developing a specific site. That's just an initial thought, and uh, I could I could be persuaded otherwise, maybe. <laughs> Let's uh, let's turn to transportation. Um, and thank you, Sean. And I, I think you're right in your your suggestion that that is uh, pretty specific and prescriptive. Is it's something that came up in the conversation, but um, so I was trying to capture it. But maybe it's best to just leave that in the notes and not not highlight something that specific. On transportation. Um I, uh, someone earlier suggested not only walkable, but bikeable. I wonder if we could say something about the bike network. I, 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 I think we're going to see uh, in the future a lot more protected bike lanes like on 300 South. I, I, I think that I think that's coming um, and protected intersections too, like uh, 200 West and, and 300 South. Could we, could we add something uh, about a bicycling per se? Like we have, we, we have transit uh, and, and obviously sidewalks uh, everywhere. And we've already talked about having a, a, a dense network of, of streets. And then, by the way, that's another way, rather than using the term grid, you can use just the term network, connected network, and, and get around that, that uh, rectilinear grid idea. But, um, you know, the, the, the electric vehicles uh, are, are obviously uh, coming and will be part of this community design but we already have bicycling and bicycling is way up now um, mm -hmm. because of COVID. And, and I, I just think it maybe deserves uh, a, a sentence. You know, uh, and if, uh, sorry, Alan, you were about to respond. I'll let you do that. Uh, well, I was just wondering, does, do you think that last sentence in there, that, that was the intent of the last sentence, but to not be, not necessarily mention a specific mode, but look at non-motorized commuting. Uh, do you think we need to call out bicycles specifically? Well, the, the thing with regional trails, uh, when I think of trails, I think of off-street off -street, um, infrastructure, uh, bike, bike and, and ped trails, as opposed to uh, on-street infrastructure. 
And uh, particularly for utilitarian travel, the, the, as opposed to recreation, the on-street uh, is more important than the, than the off-street. Right. Yeah, hey, Helen, this, this I, uh, my, very uh, quick interjection. I think, I think, you know, I know how a document like this might be used. It's, it, this is not exactly going to be the blueprint for, for how things move forward. And it, this may be a time for us to use some hyperbole. Maybe we use uh, world class instead of robust. That's my only comment there. I, I, have a, I have one thing to add to that. My thought is maybe that last sentence, yeah, like Ted said, says build a world-class active transportation system, end it there and put that as the first sentence. I, you know, the cars will come and, and they'll be accounted for. But if that's the first part of it, it kind of shows that, you know, like Reed said, it, now it's just a system and that could include streets and trails. Um, and that's our number one priority. So what if we just add streets and trails? Or and add again, the trail, uh, I, I think, technically is off street. Uh, so it's just the addition of a word or two. Yeah. If, it, if it's truly multimodal, why don't we just add the words pedestrian and bike in there somewhere? We already have transit and traffic alluded to, but we don't have a direct reference to pedestrians or bikes. Yeah. Thanks, George. I like I liked Ross's uh, idea of just making that up front. Uh, we, we've got multimodal in there, but I might even suggest that we make that emphasize pedestrian and bicycle connectivity we're going through a really interesting discussion right now on Party's Trail through the Sugar House Business District with some various community organizations. And while it's a thoroughfare that connects Bonneville Shoreline and Jordan River Parkway trails, when you get to a destination like that, you have to accommodate people passing through, but you really have to accommodate that network of how people are arriving and coming and going from what is a major destination on that trail. And I think this will be the same way. You've got the Bonneville Shoreline Trail, which is now complete through Draper and, and into Lehigh, and you've got the Jordan River Parkway Trail. And we've talked about this serving as a, a place for connecting where those trails come very close together through the point. But when you get into the center of it, it's going to break down and not just be a thoroughfare of a connected trail, but you think of it like, you know, arteries and, and veins and capillaries and, and, you know, it breaks down to a very fine network at the destination, but you yeah. still have to accommodate activity that's just passing through. So that's kind of reflected in here, but I think it can be new, nuanced and, and massaged a little bit. Uh, one other, as I look at transportation infrastructure, I don't necessarily see parking called out and and with parking being such a major land use and you know land hog essentially of a lot of developments in the past i think uh, a simple phrase or sentence about thoughtful parking solutions including shared parking parking authorities maybe a couple other things just just you know with parking being a big land use we can't uh my mind skip over you making the best of it and not being a land hog, but smart uses. Yeah, I was actually, Jake, I was going to bring that up in the next um, paragraph on infrastructure because we talked about that a little bit with our infrastructure uh, subcommittee that, you know, as we look at Wi-Fi and Internet and, and broadband and, and um other utilities that parking really is a utility that can be thought of on a district level rather than just everybody fending for themselves with their own little parking lots for every single use that that can be a real innovative approach to think of parking as a district-wide utility so that might be a place to put it in but certainly include it under transportation as well well one one thing kind of related to that whether it goes in infrastructure or transportation. If you look at aerial imagery, um, you find that um, 
the really walkable places don't have a lot of surface parking lots. Um, I, Bethesda, look at aerial imagery of Bethesda and you won't see a single uh, surface parking lot. Um, I, 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 th I think shared parking, the idea of shared parking is, is great. The, uh, the other points that were just made, made are, are very good. Um, if, if we are talking about parking, we don't want it to be dominated by, by surface parking. And um, I, uh, again, we've looked at, at the university, we've looked at transit-oriented developments uh, now around the country, um, many, many of them, and um, sur surface parking is uh, absent uh, from uh, from most of them. Um, so, so uh, somewhere to uh, build in that notion, either either under transportation or infrastructure. And by the way, ever made the point about parking, I. I totally agree. It it belongs there, somewhere. <laughs> yeah, that's could, a big piece. Could Reed uh, could, could Reed comment about uh, you know the, you know eliminating yeah. or or you know reinforcing no surface parking lots being one of the bold ideas in that bottom paragraph. I mean that is a pretty bold idea because we're so used to seeing parking lots in any place where we gather for business and, and activity and yet um, we know the impact on walkable communities is really detrimental so I I'd love to see that maybe included as a bold idea uh, that surface yeah. parking lots are really um, not not part of this innovative approach yeah that would work yeah we can certainly uh include that of course then you have to figure out how to pay for them and that's been an issue in uh, all the pod's on the wasatch front but that's that's for later consideration but i agree in terms of uh, design principles and planning uh, we don't want us to be using valuable land for for parking can i make one one suggestion maybe uh, you know something related to parking at a minimum says it can't you know, shouldn't serve a single use. You know, that's where you get a lot of the the wasted parking. So at a minimum, you know, yeah, parking structures are great, but at a minimum it should serve multiple, you know, uses or offsetting uses. Yeah. Good that's point. a great point. And that may reinforce Jake's earlier point about that the use of that phrase, um, district parking approaches or something to that effect. I think those are great points. Yeah, I agree. Good. Well, we've we've already kind of uh, moved uh, into infrastructure and bold ideas. Let's uh, let's see anything else on um, infrastructure there. Alan, let me just add one more, and then I've got to drop off the call because I've got to hop into another um, another meeting. Uh, so we're working on our blueprint Jordan River, but. Um, the idea of connecting the range to the river through some sort of wildlife corridor that may be part of, you know, bike infrastructure and things like that. We used as an example um, in our discussion the, the new wildlife bridge that was recently put in up at um, uh, Party Summit between Salt Lake and Park City, which is well utilized now by wildlife. It has... It has no purpose other than to allow wildlife to cross the freeway. And we've got several major corridors, freeway corridor, Bangor Highway corridor, the commuter rail corridor and heavy rail and other others that really provide barriers to wildlife, but also, you know, to human activity and active transportation. And so trying to navigate, how do you bring um, some sort of a corridor through here whether it's overpasses or underpasses or whatever it happens to be that would support wildlife connectivity from range to river, which is really important as we're intervening with human, human um, interference in natural ecosystems, 
that we recognize and, and do that. But it also has a human aspect as well, because this green belt or greenway or something like that could become very iconic. And it could serve as a way to reinforce this active transportation link as well with shared pathway through that. So I'd like to see that emphasized again in that we've got wildlife corridors in there. I'd like to see that a little more prominent um, and also maybe incorporated into the bold ideas somehow as well. Uh, think about how nature connects and ecosystems connect through an area that's got heavy human intervention, but really plays an essential role in wildlife and ecosystem health as well. Alan, I had a very similar uh, uh, thought, uh, perhaps not as much uh, focused on wildlife as, as Soren's thought, but I think that that phrase range to river is really key. Mm -hmm. And um, it, uh, it certainly stretches, of course, beyond the prison site, but it is the kind of thing that could make that site very special, uh, a huge draw to firms um, and talent uh, and really make it competitive with its, its uh, competitors uh, across the country, right? If, if, it's, if that's the site where you know you can get to the mountains safely on a bike and you can get to the river safely on a bike, yeah. then it's gonna blow away its competition. So I don't. I feel like we we all have to double down on this idea, and is would that be hard? That would be really hard to make work, but it's the kind of thing that it elevates this place relative to its competition. It's worth the pain. Sounds Ted, like a bold idea. Ted, that right. has me yeah. thinking about put it in where the bold idea. Yep. where we might think about some inspiration. You know, resort towns have really figured out a lot of this connectivity and um, bringing nature. You know, Park City brings ski um, ski runs right down into the city center. And if those ski runs are not ski runs, but maybe bicycle uh, routes and green, green belts, but there's a lot of resort towns that have really figured out this urban uh, highly urban, highly natural interface in ways that may be some precedent here uh, and, and reminiscent of uh, some of those ski villages, but in a much more urban setting. Uh, yeah, thank you. Those are uh, those are terrific ideas. And, and Soren, thank you. I, I know you have to go, but uh, uh, really good input. Appreciate it. Thanks. Good to be with you all. I'm going to slip out now, but uh, that's mostly what I wanted to share. So thanks. Thanks, Alan. Great thanks. work on this, by well, the way. You. It's it's really putting together a compelling uh, perspective of this place. I appreciate your help on that. Okay. Uh, what have, What else have we missed here? Well, it's, it's not necessarily missed. Uh, and it may not belong exactly like this, but I, the the acreage of the site is what I should know, this, but don't. Yeah, it's about seven hundred acres. How how many? About seven hundred. Yeah, that's that's big enough to be. You know, before there was the new urbanism, and. Um, uh, so much emphasis uh, on um, form, they, there was this idea of a complete community, a master plan community, and the uh, terminology that was used for um, Rancho Santa Margarita and the Kentlands and so on was places you could live, work, and play. Um, and um, you have mixed use above, and we have lots of mixed use developments in um, in this region. Uh, I think we've counted 30 or so, um, but uh, this has the potential to be a complete community at 800 acres. Um, and um, where, uh, you know, in, in theory people um, can live and, and work 
uh, without ever leaving the community and, and play uh, and shop and so on and so forth. Um, uh, it's, it's certainly um, uh, an idea that um, has uh, a, a lot of appeal to people uh, and it does reduce uh, traffic when you have some sort of jobs housing balance. It reduces the amount of uh, traffic coming in and, and leaving. Uh, uh, and so uh, I don't know if that uh, goes under bold ideas or, or if, if people think 800 acres is too small for a truly master plan, sort of so even well-connected, but self-contained, but, but that, that's, um, that, that, that actually predates, you know, Dewani and, and Calthorpe and so on. Yeah, I th in fact, I think that's very much in the vision and, and with the direction that the, the legislature set out. And they talked about a strategic plan that uh, they didn't use the word balance, but it was essentially driving it, finding the right mix of, of residential, commercial, office, et cetera that would minimize off-site trips. So I think, uh, yeah, that's that's worth highlighting. Alan, I, and, Re and Reed, I am a little apologetic about this, but I find myself um, not, I think we overstate that for this site. I think if we, I think if our intention is to, is to have a, a site that minimizes, um, it minimizes trips that are generated from the site that could possibly at be at odds with creating a site that is a powerful um, economic generator, which may actually be more valuable for this part of the region. Um, if it's a powerful economic generator, it may be the kind of thing that is that it has secondary benefits like driving significant transit increases that helps make great transit work in that part of the region which could have a ton of additional benefits on that side economically um the spin-offs economically could be really powerful having a really strong like downtown like uh economic presence halfway between Provo and Salt Lake, that has huge benefits. So I just wanted to be a counterpoint on that, that I, I, I think that in my view, uh, balance is not as big a priority for this site as being a powerful uh, economic engine. Ted, I really think that we didn't use the term balance. Is said to make a strategic plan that considered those things. So, and, and yeah, I, think yeah. I agree completely on the idea that you're you're going to be generating counter trips here regardless. And if you can plan for those, you've really done the internal capture is not nearly as critical as it is that it all work overall. And so that could be more people coming and going from there. If if the infrastructure already exists, you're just capitalizing on an opportunity. When we, we say mixed use, we're already talking about internal capture. Some will happen automatically. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, when, when you when you analyze a mixed use development site using ITE or the methodology, the EPA methodology that we came up with, you, you, you're already talking about some internal capture. So I think it's a matter of degree. And I, I don't disagree with uh, Ted. I think, I, I think maybe the live, work, and play thing was, uh, uh, I, I, maybe you can have both. You, you know, you, you certainly wouldn't want it uh, to be too heavily uh, oriented toward non-residential uh, at the expense of residential or vice versa. Maybe it's just ha uh, maybe maybe the word balance is exactly the right way to to put it. So you um, don't preclude the economic engine that Ted's talking about, but you still have 
something that um, uh, a place that uh, allows uh, for this uh, sort of self-contained lifestyle? Yeah, I, I hear you. And Alan, I think you were you were getting at sort of a reconciliation of these uh, these ideas. They don't have to be mutually exclusive. No, I don't think so at all. No. I, I'm not uh, under bold ideas. We talked about we did. You accurately reported it. We did talk about incorporating some of the historical pr uh, prison into the site. But I wouldn't want to steer that too carefully. I mean, I've I've worked with groups that said, you know, when you've got a big building, you should use it for something like a market or something like that. And there may be a way to do some of that. I I'm not sure, but uh, uh, I think we were, we're it, it, prisons are not necessarily pretty places, <laughs> and uh, I don't think that should be a constraint. Yeah, yeah, I, I react the same way. I when, that that was the one thing as you were. Alan, you were reading through this uh, and it all sounds so good and you did a really great job. But when we got to historic prison, I went, wait a second, uh, that's yeah, historic factory maybe, but historic prison, prisons are, are not nice places. <laughs> it's, uh, it's interesting that this topic has become, <laughs> A point of uh, real community contention. <laughs> I got uh, got a long letter this week uh, saying just the opposite. That, uh, we really need to protect much of it. I, so I, I think it's an, it's an idea that can be considered. Look at whether you know we include guard towers as part of a, a plaza or you know some open space for a high tech firm or little cafe or something um but uh, i yeah i don't expect that and i don't think anybody expects that we'll be keeping the whole thing and and looking at a block of concrete i think the key the key might be to preserve the history and you might do that with a partial building or something but there needs to be a memorial or some place where you can go like social hall avenue you walk under the street and you get a a, a history lesson on what happened in that location. So that needs to be preserved. I, I don't know that a building, keeping a building or a guard tower is necessarily a part of that. Yeah. And, and I remember site is because there was a prison there. So, I mean, it, it, it may be that simple, but telling the story about you know, why you have the opportunity that is very special now is because they can build together and they use this prison for a period of time. Yeah, and this is Christine. I just want to chime in a little bit here. There has been some community outreach to Allen um, in some form or fashion. It has been represented that Draper City wants to preserve as much of this prison as possible. And in fact, that is not the case. Draper is working with Allen in the direction of, of how we should, as Don quite pointedly just stated, memorialize some sort of history, but what that looks like, we do not have any preconceived notions that Alan needs to save buildings upon buildings. That is to be determined in this process. So just wanted to make that clear. <laughs> We're not pushing Oh, thanks, Christina. And I, I certainly understand that. Thanks. Yeah. If one thing on, if, you know, we mentioned before the idea of uh, recycling the buildings and concrete site material, if, if, if that does happen and there is some, um, you know, some, some signs or some information that lets the public know that the old building materials are, are there, but they're, they're in the plaza, they're in the, you know, wh whatever it is recycled and reused. I think that's, that's also a fun way to, to keep that history alive a little bit. Yeah. I think these are all good ideas. So Alan, um, Mike Haddon, the executive director of the Departments of Corrections. I know he's working on saving certain elements and 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 things from the buildings to kind of commemorate what's happened there over the course of the time that that's been at that location. So if we're talking about this, we probably should coordinate with him. 
because he's got a team specific, specifically looking for the thing and looking at what they want to keep from the site. Um, yeah. You know, for future reference. Point, Jim. And he and I have had some conversations and there are some things at the site that are interesting. They've got uh, a mechanism for locking uh, various cell doors uh, allow you to lock or unlock all of them or any of them individually. It's called Johnson bars, and it's a pretty uh, interesting technique that's used only in two places, and that's at Alcatraz and in Draper. Wow. So I, I think they've talked about taking an example of those and making a little uh, – you know, history center or museum out at the, the new correctional facility and incorporating those. So you're right. I mean, we'll throughout this process, uh, understand we're collecting big ideas here. We're going to be getting into the planning process later. That's going to get into the details and what it looks like and uh, you know, how all these things fit and what we can accommodate, what we can't. Obviously, uh, money is going to be a big part of it. Um, just in this last week, I've had several people and legislators in particular talking about how this site is going to pay for all of their pet projects. And um, so we're, we're very quickly going to have to bring a little reality into the process as well to say, all right, if we're going to meet the public quality of life uh, goals that have been set out in the statute, if we're going to pay for the infrastructure, if we're going to not just on site, but in some of the surrounding uh, region, uh, there's got to be a return here. And so we're going to have to very carefully balance costs with returns and all the things that a private developer would do. I think we've got a little more flexibility than uh, a private developer, but you know, we can't ignore market realities. So here we're kind of thinking vision, we're thinking uh, great ideas. Uh, at the end of the day, we'll also have to figure out how to pay for it and how to balance it with uh, you know, the legislature's goals for funding other projects through this as well. So, but at this point, uh, I don't want anybody to feel overly constrained. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Okay, I think uh, this has been just a, an outstanding discussion and uh, your additions and uh, clarifications really will make this a better document. So I'll, I'll uh, find some time and, and uh, do a little bit more editing. Um, but as I said, at the end of the day, this is going to be better because of, of your input. And if other ideas or thoughts come to mind, don't hesitate to send me a, a text or an email. and We'll, we'll do that. Alan? Yeah. Uh, this, is, this is Ross. I, I have one other thought under the infrastructure section. Um, I, I, we've, it's talked about in other parts of this document, but, you know, one of the big things we're facing moving into the future is availability of water. Um, and, and this, you know, could be a great example of reduced water use, um, you know, cause there's a finite amount of that available. So maybe under the infrastructure section, we could add something about, um, you know, reduced water consumption, um, you know, which also uh, reduces the, the wastewater footprint as well. Yeah, um, let me just make a note of that. And that's covered heavily by the environment and uh, air quality group, but I, I think it's it certainly is an infrastructure issue. One, one other thing, uh, going back to what would seem to be uh, the most controversial idea, you know, the master plan community live, work and play. Uh, if even, even if there is a lot of uh, commuting in and out, um, there's uh, a great advantage to having balance. 
because if you, you think about it, if every if it were strictly residential, everyone would be commuting out in the morning and we'd only be using half of your infrastructure, yeah. you know, yeah, roads. Uh, if it were totally employment, the exact opposite. People would be commuting in in the morning and out in the afternoon and you'd only be using half of your infrastructure. So the idea of balance doesn't only mean internal capture, but much more efficient use of infrastructure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it does. And interestingly, in the interview yesterday with uh, some of the planning firms, we, we talked about uh, you know, one concept that they had was to, you know, keep more of the land open and, and then on the, the remaining balance be uh, have more dense development because in part that reduces infrastructure costs and allows you to uh, maybe accomplish more. So yeah, I think those, those concepts are real and very much on the table. Okay. Anything else? All right. Well, I'll uh, I'll spend some time um, trying to incorporate these. I can't promise that uh, I'll state them exactly as you'd like, but I'm I'm hoping that the the primary goal is to capture the ideas that can be passed on to the the planning team, and that kind of maybe leads into the last topic on the agenda, and that's you know, our, our next meetings and what comes next and what your ongoing and future involvement will be. We're not done. <laughs> We're going to continue to take advantage of your goodwill and expertise. So uh, we will not meet in November and December. I figured the last weeks of November and December, we wouldn't get very good participation anyway. Uh, so we'll be working with um the the planning firms trying to to get to a finalist and entering into a contract with them we're putting together a scope of work that um, not quite final yet but it'll have uh, maybe kind of four key sections and at the end of each of those you know the first is kind of a discovery session section Uh, then we'll be doing some brainstorming and developing scenarios then we'll refine a preferred scenario, and then at the end, uh, come up with the, the final framework master plan and some framework documents that will uh, provide guidelines for development. At the end of each of those, we're going to ask the, the planning teams to come back to us as staff, but also to you as working groups and share their thinking and where they are. And so we'll be asking you to, to uh, get involved at periodic stages over the spring and early summer to uh, help refine the work of the planning teams. Uh, so if you're willing to do that, we would uh, would love to have that kind of participation. We'll also do a little bit more public outreach uh, as we have um, scenarios that are developed. So that's kind of where things are heading. And uh, again, would would appreciate your involvement in helping provide the voice of the the public, the voice of the experts, uh, the voice of community leadership in uh, those uh, next steps. Any questions or thoughts about that? Okay. Well, before I I turn it back to to Jim, I, I guess I don't know how to adequately express it, but uh, I'll say what I've said many times, and that's thank you. Uh, you are all busy. You've got uh, a lot of things going on. And for you to take some time to think through these issues and help us try to get this right and build a community that will, uh, for uh, a long time to come, benefit our region. Uh, is is a great act of, of public service on your part and really helps um, us as a small staff uh, leverage our limited resources to make sure that we're thinking about the right things in the right way. So uh, thanks very much. And Jim, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, thank you, Alan. You know, I, I want to echo Alan's um, 
sentiment. I was just sitting here looking at the list of the people that are on this meeting and past meetings and the time that you've spent in uh, working groups and working on this. And, you know, I just thinking of the value of everybody's time here and how much has been spent, but the value is beyond what the hourly wages would cost to get this type of input. Um, it'll go, it'll be much beyond that. And then, you know, we've talked about having a world-class development and, you know, it will be, and it will be because of the input of folks like yourself that have input um, on this process. I'm, uh, I, today was another great discussion and the insight to, it kind of blows me away the insight that you all have and of course it's this a lot of this is out of my wheelhouse so um, I'm a little confused by it all anyway but I'm grateful for that that we have people to lean on you know I was on a, a call um, yesterday with some folks from uh, uh, some of the East Coast states and they made the comment that whenever they want to they're trying to figure something out they're like oh, we need to find out what utah is doing because they do things right and that was echoed in our interviews by some of the private sector folks the other day and uh you know i part of that the reason we do it right is because of being inclusive and 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 inviting people into the process such as yourself and it makes it so much better the process is so much better because of your participation and although um, you're not getting a, a monetary reward out of it. You all, I'm sure, will get some satisfaction of knowing that when you see this development become world class, class facility, that you had some involvement in. And I just want to thank you all and thank Al, you, Alan for your leadership. Um, you know, we're, we're moving in a great direction because of Alan's leadership. So I want to thank you all. And uh, it looks like we won't be meeting for a few months, but. Um, we'll appreciate your future support when that time comes. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.